Good evening. You're watching Arirang News at 8. It's Monday, January 13th here in Korea. Live from Seoul, I am Yuji Hae. We begin this evening at the nation's top office and another reference by President Park Geun-hye about a possible reunification of the two Koreas. In an interview with Bloomberg News published on Monday, President Park said reunification would serve as an opportunity for the Korean economy to take a, quote, fresh leap forward. She added that her administration would do its best to make more people understand and recognize the need for reunification. President Park also said that nobody knows when the two Koreas will become one again, but she pledged to work toward bringing about that day at an early date. Moving now to a New Year's press conference by the main opposition Democratic Party. The party's chief, Kim An gil used the opportunity to take aim at President Park Geun-hye while stressing universal welfare and a gradual reunification with North Korea. Our Kim Hyun ji reports. Democratic Party chief Kim An gil criticized President Park's New Year's speech, saying she failed to provide concrete details on how she intends to improve the livelihoods of ordinary people in a country with the world's highest suicide rate among the young and senior citizens. The president did not mention economic democratization or welfare, even once during her New Year's speech. It's shocking. Kim said his party will promote welfare support aimed at helping people live a dignified life. My party will strengthen policy for education, housing and health care to stop the collapse of the middle class and restore the ladder of hope that enables the poor to move into the upper class. Specifically, the Democratic Party chief said his party will push for free school meals, free high school education, and cutting the cost of college tuition in half. He added that he and his party will work toward putting a cap on rental prices, including jeonse, which requires that a large lump sum deposit be paid up front and is returned in full at the end of the rental period. Kim also called for a strengthening of public health care policy and an expansion of public medical facilities for patients with severe diseases and dementia. He stressed that the party will oppose any attempt by the government to privatize health care or railway services. He also said he welcomed President Park's concept of reunification as a jackpot for the two Koreas, but stressed that the government must be sure to take practical steps to improve inter-Korean relations and prepare for a gradual and peaceful reunification with North Korea. Targeting the local elections in June, the Democratic Party leader vowed to overcome the factionalism within his party and respond quickly to the public's demands. To break a long-standing deadlock in parliament, he pledged to push for an independent investigation into the alleged illegal electioneering by state institutions in 2012. Kim Hyun-ji, Arirang News. Another mass walkout could be on the horizon not long after a railway strike that hit the nation last month. A powerful doctors association has warned that it is ready to go on strike in March to protest a government plan to deregulate the medical industry. Our Park Ji-won tells us more. The Korean Medical Association, which boasts some 90,000 doctors as its members, says it will go on general strike starting March 3rd unless the government changes plans to establish for-profit hospitals and telemedicine services. The association opposes the government's drive towards telemedicine and for-profit hospitals and demands a fundamental reform of the nation's health insurance system. However, the doctors' association is open to dialogue. Depending on the negotiations with the government, the strike could be delayed, according to an emergency planning committee. The health ministry has also shown a willingness to start talks with the association. The government respects the medical association's decision to defer the general strike and engage in dialogue through a consultative group. The government will enter talks with an open mind. The situation was sparked when the government put ads in newspapers last week promoting the advantages of telemedicine services and for-profit hospitals. The Medical Association is strongly opposed to both, saying they will impair the quality of medical services for citizens. In its statement, the Doctors' Association said the telemedicine program has never been fully tested in Korea and it is not yet a reliable way to make a diagnosis. 
The Medical Association also said the government is misleading citizens, disguising the establishment of for-profit hospitals as if it is an investment measure for mid-sized hospitals when it is actually aiming to establish for-profit hospitals. In response, the health ministry said the teleconsultations are mostly aimed at low-risk patients and those who live in remote areas where visiting doctors is not easy. The government also said the for-profit hospitals will be allowed to run additional projects like attracting patients from other countries which will not affect the public nature of the medical service in Korea. The government has been pushing for the establishment of both along with other deregulating measures as a means to expand the nation's medical industry. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. After a months-long tug-of-war, South Korea and the United States have finally settled on a new cost-sharing agreement for the stationing of U.S. troops in Korea. But some are wondering aloud whether this was the best Seoul could do. Our Han Dae-eun reports. 866.6 million U.S. dollars. That is the amount South Korea will pay this year to keep the more than 28,000 U.S. troops on the Korean peninsula. Seoul's foreign ministry says this was a successful deal as Washington has settled on an amount that's $75 million less than what it initially wanted, despite automatic spending cuts known as the sequester that have slashed the military's budget. But what's more worthy of notice, officials say, is that the U.S. agreed on specific measures to enhance transparency. Washington had long been criticized by the South Korean public for not revealing how defense costs were spent. A new monitoring system will be set up that will effectively track shared military expenditures, and the two sides will be required to submit annual spending reports to the Korea-U.S. Integrated Defense Dialogue, better known as KIDD. The U.S. will also report defense cost outlays on the peninsula to the Korean parliament. We have made an effort to produce a reasonable outcome that's acceptable to the parliament and the people, taking into account the stationing conditions for the U.S. troops, as well as our government's financial capacity. But some are critical of the deal, saying it has left several long-standing issues unresolved. They point out that Washington is not keeping its promise to shoulder the cost of relocating the main U.S. military base from Seoul to Pyeongtaek in 2016. Instead, they seem to be amassing a large amount of money and asking for more, but it's not clear how much has gone to the Pyeongtaek relocation. The deal will be taken to the parliament in early February for ratification. But amid such divided opinions, it looks like it won't necessarily be smooth sailing. And then, Arirang News. It proves to be a tumultuous year ahead for Northeast Asia as Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is likely to further advance his nationalist agenda and further boost spending on military hardware. For more on Tokyo's intentions and the diplomatic friction with its neighboring countries, we go one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Nam Chang hee professor of international politics at Inha University. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me here today. Right, Professor. A high-level Japanese official announced over the weekend that Japan is likely to mend uh, its pacifist constitution by the first half of this year. Mm -hmm. Now, with the lack of atonement and remorse over its wartime atrocities, uh, backed up by Yasukuni War Shrine visit by the mm -hmm. Japanese Prime Minister, mm -hmm. should we be concerned of Japan's moves? Yeah, first, uh, what Japan's uh, government is trying to do is not to change the constitution in the first half of the, this year, but they're going to reinterpret mm -hmm. their constitution in a way that they can uh, have, take a more proactive role in the security affairs of this, uh, in, the, in this part of the world. And uh, should we, be, uh, should we um, be worried about uh, Tokyo's move? Um, my answer is um, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. At first, uh, Japan is mostly concerned about China, so it is not threatening Korea at all. And secondly, Japan is unwilling and unable to return to its pre-war militaristic country, um, given the fact that it faces much larger neighbors. And the Korea, too, is not a, a small 
uh, you know, um, country is, is a now a uh, rising country and it's more like a middle power dolphin. The, lastly, uh, Japan is an ally to the United States, so is Korea to the US. So both allies uh, logically uh, cannot be a threat to each other. Mm. Well, given the strong opposition from Korea and China, do you think it's likely that they will go ahead with this move uh, by the first half of the year? As I told you, uh, the Japanese government is not planning to change the constitution, mm -hmm. but is revise. Revise? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, they will uh, reinterpret mm -hmm. their constitution so that uh, um, uh, it can exercise so-called uh, collective self-defense. Uh, in the past, in 1972 and 1981, I remember, uh, Japanese official position was that it has individual uh, self-defense rights, but uh, the constitu constitution does not permit the country to exercise collective self-defense. And this conflicts with the fact that it is an ally to the United States. Mm -hmm. So it, now it wants to uh, reinterpret. Yes. I see. Okay, thank you for clearing that for us. Um, now, moving on to another topic here is the Japanese media outlets report that mm -hmm. Tokyo is to revise guidelines mm -hmm. for textbooks mm -hmm. to bolster its uh, territorial claims. Mm -hmm. And this is obviously going to uh, further worsen bilateral mm -hmm. ties with Korea and China. Why would they push ahead with such controversial acts? Mm -hmm. um, to be more clear, uh, I heard that uh, Japan's Ministry of education and science is going to um, uh, extend uh, their claim over Tokdo to high school textbook. Uh, high school textbook, textbooks, uh, education guideline manual. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in, year, uh, in 2008, uh, you know, they uh, included uh, that uh, claim in the junior high school textbook education uh, manual, but now, they now they're going to you know, extend to high school uh, textbook. And this is absolutely, uh, definitely not a friendly uh, move uh, you know, of Japan. I read uh, that it is an indication of greed of Japan mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that the, the Japanese government is still insensitive uh, to Koreans' feeling about Tokto. You know, um, Tokto is a symbol of our national pride and uh, our uh, national independence. So I hope Japan's uh, government now becomes more uh, underst understand understand more about uh, the fact that uh, the talk claim, their claim over Tokyo does not serve, uh, you know, uh, their own interest because it only delays the very much needed uh, Korea-U.S.-Japan secret cooperation which is also is going to serve Japan's national interest. Mm -hmm. and speaking of security, Japan has ramped up its defense mm -hmm. spending and mm -hmm. plans to buy more mm -hmm. F-35 jets. Now, mm -hmm. what does this mean? What do you read into Japan's uh, uh, expansion military uh, muscle? Okay, uh, F-35 is the fighter plane mm -hmm. that my country, Korea, is, going, is also going to procure in the near future. It is a high-tech, uh, you know, fighter plane because it has a stealth function. The radar cannot detect, uh, it cannot easily detect uh, the, the plane. But uh, the, the reason uh, behind the Japanese government uh, has already des decided to procure 42 F-35 and even buy more like uh, 100 uh, is because of the fact that China uh, is going to deploy uh, J-20 and J J-31 uh, by the year of uh, 2018, and the number is going to be like uh, around 700. So Japan's, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, Air Force will be outnumbered when they have a, a conflict over Senkaku Delta. So this is a kind of balancing measure, I, I understand, to, you know, better deal with rapidly uh, expanding uh, Chinese uh, air force. Is it a possibility that we might see some military clash between the two countries? Um, I think given the fact that China and uh, Japan uh, you know, exchanges 
you know, verbal threat. And the fact that uh, Japan's prime minister paid vi his visit to Yasukuni Shrine against, you know, Chinese, uh, you know, uh, request, I think it, it, it is going to be more likely that we're going to, we are going to uh, see a limited uh, scale of conflict like a skirmish. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it's like a 30% or 40% possible to see that happen uh, this year, okay. I'm afraid. But Professor, uh, now before we let you go, can Korea and Japan find a way to reduce risk of conflict in this region? Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, you know, Japan's um, efforts to uh, beefing up its military capability is not aimed at us. Mm -hmm. It is aimed at uh, deterring or more better uh, managing Chinese rapid military, military expansion. Uh, but still, uh, to Koreans, uh, their uh, absurd claim of a Tokto is very much threatening and their his history distortion is not uh, pleasing. So um, uh, at the moment, the summit would not work. So I would rather recommend uh, that the you know, lower level uh, you know, um, secret cooperation uh, should, should continue. Uh, but at the same time, Korea needs to uh, take stern and resolute uh, policy position with respect to uh, our uh, territorial integrity and uh, history distortion issues. All right, two-track approach. Two, that's what we call two-track approach. Fantastic. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Professor Nam, for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you. Touch base with journalists, experts, and analysts who are taking the pulse of Asia's heartbeat. South Korea's defense minister. In a lively half hour, join Arirang's Yu Ji Hae for the day's top stories, current affairs, business, technology trends, plus global weather forecasts, and more. Arirang News. Every weeknight, live on Arirang TV. It appears the Korean economy is becoming even more dependent on its two biggest conglomerates, Samsung and Hyundai Motor. Data released by Chebel.com shows that the combined operating profit of the two conglomerates accounted for more than 30 percent of that of all Korean companies for the first time in 2012. Samsung accounted for about 21 percent, while Hyundai Motor took up about 9 percent. This is a combined increase of about 6 percent compared to the previous year. Experts have raised concerns that the country's heavy reliance on a few business giants would pose risk for the overall economy during the time of a crisis. Responding to the report, Finance Minister Hyun Oseok said on Monday that the government is analyzing the level of economic concentration of Samsung and Hyundai. And good news for Korean consumers looking forward to bargains on their favorite import products. The finance ministry said Monday that the price of foreign brand import clothing, cosmetics and watches will drop by as much as 50 percent in Korea as early as March. It said the move is to enhance competition among importers and will include the promotion of parallel imports to root out the monopolies which are blamed for excessively high import costs. Parallel imports refer to the import of goods outside distribution channels that own exclusive sales rights in a nation. And moving now to a five-part series on Korea's industrial competitiveness, we kick off with the parts and materials industry. The sector, which used to depend heavily on imports, is now leading the nation's exports thanks to active corporate investment and government support. Hwang ji looks at the prospects and the challenges that remain. This Korean semiconductor packaging company has recently found a way to make the world's thinnest chip. Normally, companies produce one millimeter thick semiconductors, but we're able to produce them with a thickness of half of that. We are ahead of every other company. Until around 10 years ago, Korean companies hardly reported any breakthrough in the manufacturing of parts and materials, but it's a different story these days. Now Korea is the world's fifth largest parts and materials exporting nation closely following Japan. And with the domestic parts and materials sectors getting a boost recently, the trade surplus last year reached a record high of nearly $100 billion. That is nearly 40 times larger than the sector's trade surplus recorded in 2001. 
Exports of parts and materials currently take up almost half of the nation's overall exports. Experts say the improving competitive edge of Korea's finished goods are also helping the parts and materials sectors. The rise in exports of products like television, mobile phones, automobiles and machinery have pushed up demand for key components of those goods. The Seoul government is determined to make Korea the world's fourth largest exporter of parts and materials by 2020, surpassing Japan and more than doubling the sector's trade surplus to $250 billion. While the nation has made a leap forward in manufacturing parts, it still lags behind in developing new materials. The problem is Korea is far behind Japan in the area of new materials, while China is catching up fast in making parts. To narrow the gap with Japan, the government has promised to pour $280 million into the local industry every year until 2025. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. And taking it now to Thailand, a shutdown in Bangkok begins with anti-government protesters blocking off many of the roads leading into the country's capital with the aim of forcing Prime Minister Ing Lok Sinawat from office and scuttling elections scheduled for February 2nd. Connie Kim reports. In a planned protest to overthrow embattled Prime Minister Ing Lok Sinawat, about 50,000 protesters blocked major intersections in the capital city of Bangkok on Monday. Protesters said they will also cut off electricity and water supplies to some government offices. The People's Democratic Reform Committee protest group is behind Monday's Bangkok shutdown. They are demanding that an appointed government run the country and a cancellation of February elections, which Ing Lung's ruling party are almost certain to win. They say the current leader is only a proxy for her brother, exiled former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, who was ousted by the military in 2006. 140 schools were closed on the first day of the demonstrations Monday, along with dozens of hospitals, hotels and fire stations. The government has beefed up security, stationing about 20,000 police and military personnel in and around the capital. So far, the protests have been without violence. Ahead of the planned shutdown, protesters on Sunday, led by head protest leader Sutep Tak Suban, started blocking major intersections in the capital to create traffic jams where an estimated 700,000 vehicles pass through on a daily basis. Things turned violent when unknown gunmen opened fire on a group of anti-government protesters at a rally site in Bangkok. At least seven people were injured. Protest leader Sutep said the rallies will continue unless Prime Minister Ing Lok steps down. We cannot compromise on any offers. This is non-negotiable. So if we lose this fight, then we lose. If we win, then we win. There's no win-win for both sides. The army and the police have expressed concerns of escalating violence that could lead to a coup attempt. Since the protests began in October, eight people have died and 470 have been injured in street violence. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Let's go over to our Kim Bogyang at the Weather Center for the latest forecast. The Bogyang, we got off to a very cold start to the week here in Seoul. Is this going to continue throughout the week? Well, Tia, it looks like this icy cold weather will persist through Wednesday. Now, currently, cold wave advisories have been issued throughout the country, and it's not only cold, but also very dry. The humidity level in Seoul and the East Coast regions is at 20%. Taking a look at the current conditions, the nation is under the influence of a cold high pressure system, which is why we're seeing clear skies across the map. Now, in this cold, dry weather, it is important that you drink sufficient amounts of water and keep yourselves hydrated. But the good news is that fine dust has disappeared thanks to the bitter cold atmosphere. Other than that, Gangwon-do and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces are under a cold wave alert and a cold wave warning has been issued in most parts of the central regions. 
Looking ahead at tomorrow's readings, Seoul starts off the day at minus 9 degrees with a high of 1. Meanwhile, Daegu and Gwangju peak at 3. Moving on to other regions, Jeju reaches 5 degrees, all the while Tokdo and Mount Kumgang top out at 1 and minus 8 degrees, respectively. Well, that's all for now. Stay warm in the cold and back to you, Chihe. Thanks, Pogyong. And that's a broadcast on this Monday evening. I'm Yuji Hainsel. Thanks for watching.